Hello and welcome to Matters of the Heart, a show that talks about just that. Relationships are about contentment, comfort and friendship. Or is that what all marriages evolve into after a few years? How does one keep the spark alive? Do you remember the first flutter in your heart or the adrenaline rush when you met the love of your life? That feeling that overtook all possible rationale. Well, today we are going to discuss that and lots more with our fantastic panel. First up, we have Natasha Bhadwar. She is a filmmaker, a journalist and an author. She's also a mother of three beautiful girls who are an intrinsic part of her writing. Pooja Makhija is an author, nutritionist, food guru and a mother of two. She believes we need to feed our bodies with love, understanding and food. Anuradha Gupta is here to talk about all things marriage and matchmaking as the CEO and founder of an international matchmaking company called Vows for Eternity. And Shruti Hassan needs no introduction. She is an award-winning actor and singer who has established herself both in the Hindi and Telugu film industry. Today we talk about the promises and the vows that we make when we decide to spend the rest of our lives with someone. Let's go back to that feeling of excitement and flutter during the first meeting. Natasha, we begin with you. So of course it's impossible to forget the first time that one met the person who eventually became one's partner. But um, I have to say it would be a very, very rare relationship when you also know in that first time that this is likely to be your partner. I uh, spent my life being very intrigued by my husband, still, uh, still am. And it pretty much started like that, like who's this guy in the corner of the party? And you know, that natural uh, gravitation towards the one person who seems to not fit in. And uh, that's, that's really where it started from. Um, there, there were no flutters for some time, I can tell you that. And how did you figure out he's the one? It uh, grew on us. Uh, we, um, we started uh, what I call dating. And what he, uh, you know, had no name for, I began to call him my boyfriend, but he would, he's from a small town, so he just didn't have the same vocabulary. Also, uh, you know, he brought in a very slow Urdu culture into our relationship, which was an amazing novelty for a Delhi girl. Well, that is wonderful. Uh, Pooja, what about you? How did you meet your husband? And at which moment did you realize that he is the one? So my meeting, so to say, was uh, very, um, very Bollywood packed. Um, his brother has, is married to my sister. So we met at the wedding. And we did all the, um, all the naughty flings uh, that happen uh, at a wedding, of course. At that point in time, um, I had absolutely no idea this man is going to be the one. And then I think we just grew on each other. He says he knows it from day one that this was the one he's going to marry. I'm not going to say that I had the same opinion then. I was, I was quite young, I was still studying. I still had lots to achieve and I still wanted to study lots. Um, so I didn't know where path was leading, but it was, uh, it was fun to have him in that in that journey. After a couple of years, uh, it seemed like a eventuality. Uh, we knew we we're not going to have any hindrances from family because one sister was already in the house. Uh, his house loved me, my house loved him. It was just the fact that we had to keep loving each other, which uh, just happened. Uh, and that's it. What a wonderful story. Anu, how was the journey for you, finding the love of your life and at which precise moment did you know he was the one you're going to spend your life with? So, um, you know, Anand, uh, I met him, I was in, I was living in London at the time and he was, uh, he was based in Los Angeles and I was 34. I was very, I'd been very commitment phobic all up till that point. Um, I, you know, I, I wasn't sure if I had it in me to to spend life with one person. So we were introduced and we met uh, for dinner and uh, five hours, you know, just talking. We had dinner, we went for a walk around, you know, by the Thames, we had a nightcap and it, it just flowed. It, you know, it was a wonderful evening and um, we spoke about everything, you know, politics, so many things, but not nothing related to marriage or relationships or, or, or any of that. And that's it, you know, we went our separate ways and. 
we didn't speak to each other. We didn't drop a text. We didn't, you know, he checked on me the next morning and said, would you like to meet up for a coffee? And I, you know, it just wasn't, I hadn't planned for it. it just couldn't do it. And he was leaving for Austria or somewhere the next day. So nothing for three months. Three months later, we, we connected and I was, um, you know, I was traveling to Los Angeles and we spent time together for maybe three or four days. Even then, I didn't, I didn't really realize that it was a great time. We had good, you know, we spent, we spent time together. At the airport, that's the time. That's the time when I knew he'd come to see me off. I was going back to London. Just at one point, you know, he, as I was leaving, I said, okay, bye. And he hugged me. And that's when, as he hugged me and he, he, I just, I don't know what happened. There was something that switched. I don't know, some switch went on. And, and I felt that, you know, hey, just don't let me go. Like, it was just at that point, I felt like, you know, he's going to walk away. And I felt like something very important. I'm losing something that's very, very precious to me. It was a very alien feeling. I'd never felt like that before. I didn't know I could feel like that before. I wasn't in school. I wasn't in college. And, you know, I got onto the plane. I was, it was a terrible, very, very long journey. It felt like a very long journey. And uh, but that's the moment when I knew. I felt like, I, you know, I felt like something, just a part of me is, is, it's, you know, it's. I didn't know whether we'll meet each other ever again, right? We'd never spoken about all of that. You know, exactly a year later when we got married, on the same date that we first met, and that was a coincidence. Shruti, with a successful career and successful parents, do you reckon it's going to be a tough task? finding the perfect partner. With all due respect to my parents, they're incredible people to, to you know, individually, they've achieved so much, but they, they aren't my picture perfect representation of what uh, a couple should be. So that's not been my vision. So that sense of perfection in that department doesn't exist. And as far as my own life and making choices, whether it's my, like, you know, career or, or the people or the friends I choose or the relationships, I follow my instinct I've never been wrong about my instinct. There have been movies I've signed or people I've met and I've had that tingling inclination that this is great, this is going to last or this isn't, this is not going to last but it's going to be a great friendship or this is going to be a horrible film, you know. But um, I, I try to follow my instinct. I'm not worried about someone not seeing me because that's a connection I value and treasure very much. I can instinctively and viscerally feel when someone can see me for who I am. And I think that's what my relationships have been, be it professionally or personally. Shruti, the promises of marriage and commitment, do they come easily to your generation? It's not like I'm commitment phobic. I love, I love being commi committed to the idea of someone and working and building things together. But I feel that because commitment of any kind to me is very important, if I feel that it's wavering in um, intensity, approach, or discipline, really, because relationships take a certain length, length, you know, strength of discipline to maintain them, I feel that um, I really value commitment. And if I were to get married, I would very much value the vows. And if I felt that it wasn't for me, I wouldn't do it at all. There's no, there's no half day for me in that. To the apostle, think it's incredible that things are black and white and there's no space for gray. Anu, do you think people expect too much when it comes to marriage and commitment? And is it now time we need to reset those expectations? I do. I think there's a lot of emphasis placed on what one, you know, what, what we expect or, you know, what I would expect. But I don't know whether we give enough thought to... Uh, to what the other person expects from us. You know, it is a two-way street at the end of the day and both, both are equally important, it takes two to tango. So I think both need to be given equal importance in terms of expectations. I also feel with time, um, as a marriage grows, there's so many other dimensions that become a part of it. Uh, you go from two individuals to, you know, being parents, there's extended families, in-laws, all of that. And there's a different dynamics, there's a different level of involvement and expectations grow over a period of time on one hand. And on the other hand, you start taking each other for granted. So you scale back in terms of, in a lot of ways, what you are putting into the relationship because you think, hey, this is, it's good, it's done, dusted, all of that. So the effort start, you know, that you're putting in reduces and the expectations grow. So I think definitely we need to reset Reset expectations and dial down on the expectations, absolutely, certainly. So basically, Anu's like, calm down, Shruti. You have a long road ahead. 
yeah, absolutely. It is for the long haul. Not as well. Yeah. Shruti, after listening to these conversations, do you think marriage would add something to your life? Is it necessary at all? Uh, you know, I haven't really thought about it because I haven't met the person where I'm convinced, you know, that I, it, it, and that's gen genuinely how I feel. I don't know if my mind will change, but I feel that um, uh, it's, it's really about two people and like Anu said, it's so important because it's about so much that comes with the person you know, and how you fit into these two pieces. I think that's exciting, whether it lasts or it doesn't. The first step of finding out this person's world is very exciting. Setting up a new home with someone is exciting yet daunting. There are many aspects that make life fruitful. Work, relationships, family, love, career, achievements. How does one balance it all? Shruti, we begin with you. Um, it's been hard for me in the past and I feel that I had focused much more on my career, which was in fact the right thing to do at the time. But as time went on, I found that I had no one to share my successes, failures, moments with. I had amazing support from my friends and um, I just started to feel like I didn't have my person. I think I'm still in that journey of finding my person and everything that goes on in their lives. Like I said, I'm just really excited by the process of getting to know someone and their world. So yes, it's definitely hard and it's not an easy thing because at no point do you want to, you know, hold someone else responsible for the time that you are responsible to allocate appropriately in your life as in a balanced form. All right, Pooja, what is your experience? What is your advice? Ah, it's, it's, it's not easy, at least initially it's not easy. Um, to balance it all, especially when you are still trying to uh, make home in everybody's heart that you have just moved into. And getting married, of course, to one man is getting married to his whole family. And everyone, um, everyone has to love you for who you are. Because yes, you can, uh, you can start by being the most ideal daughter-in-law or sister-in-law, but then eventually you're going to be yourself. And um, I think it's very essential that from day one, you should always be yourself. Natasha, what's your advice? How does one balance it all? Career commitments, relationships? Yeah, one of the ways one balances it all is by staggering it. So that there are times in your life, there are stages in your life when your career needs you. And, uh, and you know, if you have a robust relationship and a robust support system, they will support you to be able to prioritize your career and, and whatever its demands are. And uh, a good relationship will always want you back, always uh, you know, be the place where you want to come to be safe. So it's kind of in tandem, um, but uh, really there is, uh, we do place a lot of expectations on our relationships. You have to remind yourself that you can't completely pile on to it and expect it to solve all your problems and you know fill all the uh, the vacuum in your heart, and and yet uh, you know it's a good relationship when your expectations are always there, when they're always rising, uh, when you know that you can be demanding and uh, that you won't uh, be disappointed. I know what's your advice? How does one balance it all? You know, I've been listening to all this wonderful advice and I'm, I'm, I'm taking that all in because I think I'm the one who needs the advice. I think I really struggle. You know, I think the most important thing in life is, is balance. But I also think it's the toughest thing to get. Uh, I, have a, I have a career that, um, you know, that is, um, uh, you know, very, it's quite intense. You know, and as, as the marriage years down, you know, kids, I've got little kids. Um, they, you know, the toddlers, that's, that's another level there. So it's always a struggle. Do I get the balance right? I would love to, but um, probably not. Most of the times I struggle. Most of the times I feel, um, I feel I haven't, I could do so much more. Most of the time I feel I'm short. I'm short of where I need to be or what I should be doing. I'm always torn. There are times when I might have to, we, you know, I might need to get onto a plane and, and one of my kids has 102 fever. You know, there's always that, what's the right thing? What's the right call? Also, what do you want to teach your kids? Is it about discipline and hard work and commitment? I've realized that it's, it's not, it's less about the black and white, 
you know, the, the, the beauty is in understanding the shades of gray. And undoubtedly, like everybody mentioned, a strong support structure is really important for me. That's, you know, that's my mother and my husband. So I think without them, I, they really are the wind, you know, beneath my wind. It's going ahead. The next generation, women might be more successful than men. Should... Absolutely. And I see that all the time, even now. And, and that's a great place to be. I mean, I just, what are the parameters, first of all? It's a bit um, insensitive to be like, I'm the most successful one, you know? But there have been situations like that, especially when fame is involved. I think it just changes things completely. There are a whole other gamut of emotions you need to deal with, you know? Um, you belong to everybody else as well. It's a different ball game um, than just success. I have two best friends who married really young, have kids and have the most incredible husbands because they are their best friends. They function as two friends who mean well for each other. And as Natasha said, it is about staggering and like balancing these things out. They take turns in prioritizing. I see that with actor couples a lot, where they say now is the time where you spend time with the kids, especially in the West. You hear that a lot, that I'm doing this movie, the kids are with you now. It's a different ball game, I think. Um, I have found that if a man is insecure and you're sitting at home and being what he expects or not sitting at home and still working and meeting his parameters, he could still be unhappy. It is about security, communication, and finally friendship where you can overcome because you could be a very successful woman or a very successful man, but you have your own lingering issues which will seep into the relationship irrespective of success ratios. Great. On that note, we have a question for all of you and for our audience. The question is, can daughters-in-law become daughters? Anu? No, I don't think. I don't believe that. And it does happen in rare instances, and that's that's wonderful. And here in Pooja, I think. But 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 as a sort of generalization, I don't know. I I think it's I think it's tougher. Natasha, lived experience tells me absolutely they can. Yeah. <laughs> Right, uh, Pooja. They definitely can. I think I'm. Uh, I think I'm more the daughter of the house than my husband is the son. Shruti, what is your view? So I just want to say because I've never been a daughter-in-law, everything was fine till I broke up with the boy. So you know, I was the daughter till then, and then when I broke up, it was like crickets. But I think like uh, <laughs> like Pooja said. I mean, till then they were like. All that happened, and then they broke up and said, hi, auntie, and they were just gone. They were like, my son. That's happened like with an Indian boy, with an English boy. So I think it's just a mum thing with their sons. I'm still friends with all the dads. That's the best part. So I think I'm, I'm, I've aimed next to like, put out the dad first, you know. But um, I think I agree with what Pooja said. I think that um, the relationships evolve. And I would love to be... Um, not a daughter, but I would love to be equally supportive and be a value addition to my mother-in-law's life. You can vote too. We would love to know your thoughts. All you have to do is log on to our Facebook or Instagram page and join the poll. A quick question before we delve deeper into the subject of marriage and stability. Now, we all love our partners, but a girly holiday is definitely a guilty pleasure. So, a quick question for all of you. A romantic holiday or a girly holiday? I started these girls trips uh, a little later in my life. Um, and I can't tell you how, how uh, emotionally enriching it is. And uh, yes, as much as I love my romantic holidays, uh, if you gave me the choice between the two, I would run for a girl's trip. Shruti? I really want a romantic holiday. I've been in a pandemic for six months by myself. I will take the romantic holiday in a heartbeat. I'm sick of my girl saying, baby, are you okay? We're in this with you. I'm like, actually, no one's here. And I'll take a man now. I'm good with a romantic holiday. Natasha. Okay, so we had children really early in our marriage. And uh, we have a very crowded marriage, big families, visiting constantly. So a romantic holiday is always much needed. It's the one thing that reminds us of what we were like when we were, you know, when we first met and how we can be completely madcap uh, teenagers even now and uh, fight to our hearts fill uh, without having our children staring at us and saying <laughs> they're not around. Anu? Girls trip.
let's move back to the partners in our life. Now, do you think it's always a woman's responsibility to give up her life, give up her career and move where her man is? I think a lot of that is to do with how we raise our kids. A lot is changing, absolutely, and a lot needs to change. But, but traditionally, the boys have always been raised to be the breadwinner, uh, of of the family and therefore their focus on um, on the career is very very skewed and and the girls have have been brought up sure you know with with all the best education and all of that but generally it's been an underlying tone of a supporting role I mean do your career all of that but the man is the breadwinner um, and and it really stems from that and that's the reason the man you know, is 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 quite. Uh, it's almost like that's his territory, and he wants to protect it, and he wants to be wherever he is, feels safe and secure in the in his ability to provide the best for his family, and he doesn't want to get outside that comfort zone. So the change has to come with how we bring up our kids to say that you know this is this really should be both to your roles, you know, to 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 work together as a team, and and you know if that's what you you know choose to do. A lot is changing. I think girls are also. Um, Girls are also, you know, careers are becoming a very strong part. It's, it's becoming a big part of who we are. And therefore, a lot of our choices in terms of location, even today now, are being dictated by, can I work here? Can I live here? Does this, is, this some, is there something for me to do? Not, will I try and find something to do? But will, does this work with my mainstream, whatever my, whatever my profession is? So a lot of that is changing. And I see a lot of boys, you know, men changing you know, as well, I talk to people who are now looking at, you know, they're very open and, and, and willing to move to a third location if that makes that makes the most sense for both people. Natasha, what is your view? Yeah, so obviously it's cultural expectations and, um, you know, patriarchy that, that has given us th this idea that the man's work is top priority and the woman's work is just some kind of choice that she's making. But it's really, really heartening how much has changed in our generation and in the generations, uh, you know, uh, younger than us. I mean, I'm, I'm constantly I'm making role models of young women in the way in which they negotiate their personal space within uh, their relationships, in which they make boundaries, in which they demand how, what kind of language is acceptable to them or not, in which they... Uh, you know, they're willing to uh, take risks uh, that, that you were told you, you must not make a take in relationships uh, growing up because, you know, it will just blow the whole thing up. But, you know, women are getting more and more comfortable with saying, this is me, this is my space, this is my work. And, uh, I, you know, I, I want to test you out as much as you want to test me out. So to that extent, all this, uh, the, you know, dating, all of these online relationships, long distance marriages, in mean, all of this is, I think, uh, amazing uh, progression in the way in which we are allowing our relationships to flourish. That is true. Shruti, your view? Um, as Natasha was saying, I've actually always had long distance relationships and I envision my marriage to somehow play out like that if I do get married. I think if I was to think about, you know, where the pressure point would come in at all in the relationship of let's decide a place would be probably for the best future of the children we have, because that's something that, you know, would be, would be beyond our lives and our needs. It's a responsibility. Because being an actor, musician, I work like in Chennai, Hyderabad, Bombay. London. So God bless the guys who gave to me. All right, Pooja. I'm just going to say how my choti explains it to me now. My choti is 13 years and she says, mom, I'm sorry, but I don't believe in this, that I have to, I have to change my name and my home. Uh, when I grow up, uh, um, it's going to be a barter. Either he takes my name or I take his home. So we're going to change things around and uh, my husband and I are beautifully uh, open to the idea. Pooja, how important are boundaries and personal space in any relationship? They are the most important. Um, having that personal space and not wanting to look deep into each other's phones and wanting to see who texted you and whom are you speaking with is extremely important. There can be so many things that can go wrong if you don't have that much trust and faith and you don't give that much space. 
forget to your spouse it's very important to give it to your children as well okay shruti i just found it fascinating that you know mm, people would look into each other's phones i think that's terrible <laughs> beyond words i don't know if my phone's been checked i've never done it i've never even been curious to do it i think that you know karmically if they're being an idiot it will show up in some other way i need to look at his phone but i do i, I do remember a recent incident i had like in my last relationship when they were very curious about but i don't know if you're texting someone else like you don't and that was pretty much like a deal breaker in my head because i felt like this this space this trust and this communication is so important and if you don't give the other person space honesty and trust it's going to be an issue even if they were to look at my very innocent form natasha yeah, it's really been one of my learnings about how much space a relationship demands it's infinite i thought all i wanted was to be cozy with this man to to you know spend all my free time with him i mean i want free time and i want him around but uh, i i have been surprised by how much me time i have needed i have learned to ask for i have uh, you know flourished in and uh, to that extent uh, we're constantly evolving as individuals so you know we have at different stages in life we are going to want different amounts of space for ourselves and a, and a certain kind of safe distance once in a while and your original romantic idea was meeting each other for the rest of your lives you know and being so happy about it and now when he's needy i'm like abhi nahi anu Oh, go ahead, Shruti. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to add on to what Natasha said. Is true romance for me really is being alone, completely alone <laughs> together. Have that much space, but know the person there, but they're not in your face. I know. Um, I got married later, and, and the reason that happened was for me. I always believed that I only want to get married when I meet somebody I I don't want to live without. that was the only thing that was important to me to take that step for marriage so by that time i think when one gets married a little bit later i think we are more more set in in our ways we are, you know and i was as a person i'm a very strong i'm a very independent person what i learned that it's very important in a marriage to have your personal space to have that indep- you know independence as well as interdependence because otherwise it doesn't work otherwise you really don't need each other for anything this is the balance between independence and interdependence both equally important uh, to be to to be happy and and yet be together well it's time to wrap up the show but before we end i would love to know your individual take away from this conversation for me especially today of being the only one in this position it was just lovely to get all of these amazing um, insights and thoughts and advice and i feel like i'm ready to get married now no no i'm not i'm just saying anu so i just think it's really important to be you know to be true to you to oneself and um, and to know that the only limits that really matter are the ones that we set on ourselves natasha what's your big learning marriage is hard work like most other good things in life uh, there will be ups and downs there will be periodical times when you'll be like this is it my marriage is over today uh, but you'll wake up the next morning you'll find a way to recover yourself recover your relationship uh, so stick it out it's a learning Pooja I don't think there's any relationship that's picture perfect and don't expect marriage to be like that uh, every relationship has to be worked on and you have to grow uh, to learn each other um, and if you if you're willing to give that you're going to make a, a a happy marriage bringing the show to a close I think the promises that we make in marriages and relationships grow and change new promises are made and some of the old ones are tweaked depending on our own situation and hopefully result in trust faith and ultimate happiness and i wish all of you that tonight thank you so much for joining us goodbye